to episode 21 of Eye on Horror. I am your host, James J. Edwards, and with me, as always, together till the end of time, Jacob Davidson. How you doing, Jacob? Doing good, and I guess we're stuck here in hell together forever. <laughs> <laughs> I, I totally just signed you on to do every episode until the podcast is canceled. I hope you don't mind. No, it's yeah. fun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a very like Paul Williams in Phantom of the Paradise situation. We were all in our tubs <laughs> and he just kind of approached us and made us sign a blood oath to yep. do a podcast with him for, oh God, ever. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Until you wall me up, uh, you know, I give you the last episode and then you've put in the last few bricks and wall me up. Uh, have you, you guys have probably already noticed that also with us, he didn't wait for his introduction, but that's okay because, you know, hey, <laughs> what was he going to do? Wait for me to finally get around to say, and here's John Korea. How you doing, John? I'm doing well. And hey, I'm going to take any opportunity to make a reference to Phantom of the Paradise as I can, because as we all know, Paul Williams is one of the greatest. I mean, True. fucking solidary man. Come True. on. And and if you wait for me to get around to introducing you, well, you'll be there all day. I, I'll just sit there and talk. You know, talk. Especially talk. especially about Phantom of the Paradise. <laughs> yeah. And <No>. how. <laughs> all right. What, uh, what's what been going on this week? What have you guys been doing? Jacob? Uh, Well, yesterday was the 35th anniversary of one of my all-time favorite movies and one of the greatest cult movies of all time, Alex Cox's Repo Man. So I yeah. gave that a rewatch on the Criterion Blu-ray. And man, I love this movie so much just because it is so indescribable because it's a punk movie, it's a sci-fi movie, it's uh, a crime movie, it's a mystery. It's just got all these elements rolled up into one, all these great characters and such a, a great ensemble cast because you got Emilio Estevez and uh, the late great uh, Henry Dean Stanton as the leads. The thing about Repo Man is it is a pure cult movie because it's not uh, super well known. I mean, it, it it is, but a lot of fans, you know, have, have not seen it. But those who are fans are like fans. They're yep. like hardcore in it to win it. Favorite movie, quote every line, you know, own the soundtrack fans. Oh, of course. And oh, that's yeah. such an amazing fucking soundtrack. Yeah, <laughs> Suicidal yes, Tendencies is. opens up with a fucking Iggy Pop song uh tv party tonight come on it's yep. just quick and then there's some like uh mexican music in it too <laughs> and mariachi music and stuff like it's it's such a great and that's the great thing about about the movie too is that the soundtrack saved the movie because i was reading the booklet uh from the criterion uh release and it was saying you know how uh when it came out uh, it was pulled from theaters after one week, but the soundtrack was so popular, they put it back into theaters. It's, it's that synergy of the 80s that, uh, yeah. you know, Saturday Night Fever Syndrome. <laughs> Sadly, that didn't work for Streets of Fire. Streets of Fire oh, yeah. and went to theaters. The soundtrack maybe did a little bit of a splash and then like everyone forgot about it. Despite much. having that one uh, song played on MTV once an hour. Go, going nowhere fast <laughs> it, uh no the, it was the um the, uh, boy i needs can to be dream young. about you mm, really that, that was the was, one huh. dude that was it that was a total mtv hit yeah okay i would have figured it would have been one of the fire inc ones but yeah no it wasn't it was yeah it was one of the one of the soul ones i also would have thought the stevie nicks written song would have really taken off too but I guess Stevie Nicks can't save everything. Nice. What uh? What about you, Korea? What have you been doing? Well, uh, it it was finale week on uh, the show I've been working on. I've been working on a uh, hip hop uh, reality competition show uh, that'll be coming out later this year. But we did the finale, so it's it's been a it's been a fucking busy week. I finally slept last night, and I feel so much better. Eight hours of sleep, man. People should do that regularly. Um, but they really uh, should, Even including yeah. me. Yeah, no this four this three four hours of sleep night thing is killing me. But no, it, it's been a busy week. I was able to sneak in a couple of viewings. Um, I recently got Freaks, uh, Todd Browning's Freaks on uh, Vudu, because for some fucking reason they will not release it on Blu-ray. Um, it's out on DVD, but it's, um, but yeah, there's been no news. Hopefully someday Criterion releases it. Cause that film really needs a good transfer. Like 
the uh, HD source used for the Voodoo is pretty good, but it still needs some cleaning up, and the audio needs some tuning. That's uh, what I was going to ask if it's, yeah. if it's HDX and how it looks, because when that was made, um, just not just the amount of time between now and then, but the equipment from back then, um, I was wondering how it looked. And Yeah, it looked pretty good. It's more the audio that there were some issues with. Um, just like very blown out in certain points, but God, that's such a beautiful film. Like most people only remember the last few minutes when the, when the, uh, freaks get their revenge, uh, for, rightfully so, uh, mm-hmm. might I add rightfully so get their revenge, but like the whole, most of the film is just a day in the life and showing them interacting and, it, um, and just really shows the human cause they are human. They're fucking people. They just have, uh, they're just a little different from us, but they're not. At the end of the day, they still love, they still play, they still work. They do everything we do, just with a lot more eccentricity. Uh, I'd say the uh, Gooba Gaba one of us scene is probably one of the most famous from the film. Oh, of course. And that's because it's fucking incredible. They're walking around, just a look on her face where they're like, you're going to be one of us. And she's just like terrified at the thought of uh, being one of them. It just really shows how much of a disgusting character she is, mm. especially when they're being so loving and open and accepting to him, which makes it makes that scene even more funny because everyone views it as this very terrifying scene because they're saying gooba gaba when really you're seeing the ugly side of her more so on display, yeah. unadulterated. So, And the fact that they used, Todd Browning used real freaks um, you know, real circus freaks, which, you know, it's may not be that shocking today, you know, what audiences today are used to. But if you think about the 1930s audiences, they were like, oh, that guy has no arms and legs. Yeah. Yeah. And that dude could roll cigarettes. He could roll his own and light his own cigarettes. That dude's incredible. And he's got five kids. Crawling through the mud with a, with a knife in his in his mouth. What's he going to do? Yeah. Seriously. What the fuck was that? That scene was, ter- was terrifying because <laughs> yeah. they are all coming out. They're all crawling through the mud with knives and guns and stuff. And then all of a sudden there's this one dude with no limbs at all. Knife in his mouth just struggling to go through the mud. And it's like, man, I love your enthusiasm. Love your effort. But what the <laughs> fuck are you going to do? Like, yeah. And I- I was going to say, wasn't the movie so controversial at the time that it was banned for years? It wouldn't surprise yeah. me, I believe, yeah. Yeah, it, it was it's, banned for a while. It was shocking for its for its time. You oh, know. But then again, so was Reefer Madness. And you know, uh, so. <laughs> Frankenstein and Dracula. Cool. Well, I saw um, a movie that I absolutely loved every second of, Greta. Do you guys, either of you can see Greta? Uh, I haven't yet. seen Greta, oh, no. but I did see the trailer when I saw Happy Death Day to You. That's what actually made me, it, somehow Greta flew under my radar. Maybe it's because the name is just so nondescript. And then I saw the trailer with Happy Death Day to You. And then, so I was, I still, I checked my schedule. I was still able to get into a press screening before it opened. It just opened a couple days ago from when we record this. Mm. Um, but yeah, the trailer, everything that happens in the trailer is pretty much happens in the first 15 minutes of the movie so the trailer doesn't give too much away but basically what it is is um uh, isabelle huper is uh she is the titular greta Mm -hmm. and she's this old woman who leaves handbags on the new york city subways waiting for people you know and they have an id in them so they can bring them back to her and when they bring them back to her she just turns into crazy stalker lady and uh Chloe Grace Moretz is is her mark. She's the one who finds the bag on the subway. And uh, Micah Monroe from It Follows plays her roommate who is like, no, don't bring it back to her. Let's just keep the money in it and let's go out partying. But <laughs> Chloe Grace Moretz is she's the good girl. You know, she's <laughs> she's in New York, but she's a transplant from Boston. So she's ah. like, no, the right thing to do is to bring it back. <laughs> so, you know, and they it, it ends up being a bad decision, obviously. But it's it is just such a critics are divided on this one. They're either loving it or they're hating it. And I kind of think that a lot of people don't get it. And maybe I don't get it. But it seems to me like it's directed by Neil Jordan, who did uh, The Crying Game and um, yeah. Interview with a Vampire. I was wondering that because you mentioned his name a few times. I couldn't put pinpoint the name to it. But yeah, yeah. he's the Crying Game guy. He he won an Oscar for, I think, Best Screenplay, I think. Yeah. Uh, but he um, it's by him. So I, I don't think anything is to chance. I don't think it's unintentionally campy because it is. I mean, it's not like corman waters level of camp but it is definitely it's it's like verhoven satire kind of a thing and you know every 
trope in the book is in this movie, which is in other people's problems with it. They're like, oh, it's just a formula stalker movie. It's like, well, yeah, it is. And I do have to admit the ending you can see coming a mile away. Like as it's unfolding, you're like, oh, this is what's happening. But you still want to see it unfold. It is. Oh, I just had so much fun. It's just this trashy, pulpy, melodrama stalker movie. And Isabelle Huppert is having the time of her life playing this <laughs> almost like um, Fatal Attraction-esque stalker woman. Oh, it's 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 great. I, I It's my first uh, four clocker of the uh, and four is the highest in my reviews. It's my first four clocker of the year. It's mm. uh, it was awesome. I loved every second of it. And that doesn't surprise me because Neil Jordan, his movies always had like that that borderline campy, very kind of what would be described as a very delicious like, role, <laughs> which is why like I think Jeremy Irons did work so well with him on the Borgias was because it was just like mopping every <laughs> scene, just being like overly like Mu-ha-ha-ha. so it just makes sense that he would make like a campy stalker film that would be a lot of fun i think he was just checking stuff off his bucket list he's like oh what movie should i make next you know <laughs> can't yeah. be horror movie Oof. check <laughs> and i was gonna say it'd be interesting coming out this year because uh i think it's been getting some comparisons to that uh movie coming up with octavia spencer ma as, oh, okay because both have uh kind of uh older women as uh creepy stalker horror villains so it'll be interesting to see how uh the how those do against each other wouldn't it be great if isabelle Huppert and octavia spencer were up against each other at the oscars oh right. god for for greta and ma yeah greta right. versus ma i think this year taught us that the os that that last year's oscars with get out and the shape of water was an anomaly and not <laughs> i mean tony collette the best performance of the year by a woman didn't even get nominated Yeesh. so but they did give a shout out to uh, James Karen, though. Uh, oh, the yes. So yeah. yep. they at least did one thing right. In Not just a- that. It made my heart grow three sizes to see they used a scene from Return of the Living Dead in yeah. the memorial. Yeah. <laughs> I jumped uh, up when I saw that. <laughs> oh, it was beautiful. That was that was fun. Outside of that, they fucked up major in a bunch of different ways. But yeah. what else is new? It's the academies. It's... Uh, yeah. Just remember, these are this is the same award system that gave Doctor Doolittle how many of fucking awards? Like twelve <laughs> or nominations? See, they didn't win, but they were nominated like twelve times due to being wine and dined by Fox. Yeah, and they snubbed Dick Miller and Julie Adams in the in the uh, memoriam. Well, I don't know how they work those if it goes from ceremony to ceremony or if it's calendar year. But I think both of them died in 2019, they so did. maybe yeah. maybe mm-hmm. next year. But they did snub Arlie Ermey, though. Oh, yeah. yeah. That that one's bad. Yeah. You know, because when you think of a an army drill sergeant, who comes to mind? <laughs> that man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Arlie Ermey. So, yeah, that one is pretty egregious. But, hey, they always snub someone. Yeah. I mean, he was in fucking Saving Silverman, one of the few <laughs> movies Neil Diamond was in. How the fuck can you snub him? Uh, what else has been uh, going? I, I'll tell you one thing that I did, which uh, I, you guys might have seen if you if you like our Facebook page. You might have seen I posted up a poll as to whether or not I should take advantage of the low nine ninety nine price of Anna and the Apocalypse, and there was only one vote against. <laughs> so I followed the instructions, and actually one of the votes for well one was Korea because it was his favorite movie of last year. And the other was was Kelly McNeely, who you might remember from a few episodes back that we talked. And those two, I mean, I was going to follow the the results of the poll anyway, but those two really stood up and were like, I'll buy this. So I bought it, watched it. Yeah, and you loved it, didn't you? <laughs> didn't you? I won't say I didn't love it as much as you did, but I will say the best way to describe it is how you put it. High School Musical meets Shaun of the Dead, because <laughs> that is exactly what you get. Um, I think I like the High School Musical parts a little more than the Shaun of the Dead, but that might just be me because I have such hardcore zombie fatigue right now. I'm so over zombies, which if it wasn't for you guys recommending this, I probably would have completely skipped out on this one because it's zombies. You know, I'm like, ah. <laughs> but um, the songs aren't quite as catchy as as I would like to have them be, but it is fun because like you'll, the songs are spaced far enough apart where you almost forget that you're watching a musical. Like all of a sudden, you know, 
she'll break into song walking down the hallways with the lockers. You're like, oh, yeah, it's a musical. And then you'll forget. And then all of a sudden the cafeteria song breaks out. You're like, oh, yeah, it's a musical. And I think my favorite songs are the ones. There's a couple of them that are done by the main bad guy who I won't give away who he is just yet. Um, but I think he has the best songs. They remind his songs reminded me of uh, some of the later songs from Shock Treatment. Yeah. Um, although they're not nearly as catchy as the shock Treatment ones and they're not nearly as uh, as quirky either. They're more straightforward modern production, but they're uh, they have the same kind of spirit to them. I will say this. I completely disagree. I think the main villain was probably the weakest part. Um, mm-hmm. I did like his songs, though. Also, I highly disagree because just you wait. James, you just saw the movie the other day. You'd be walking or down the street and you'd just be start humming Hollywood ending or a brand new day or something. And then next thing you know, you're going to be like me and obsessively listening to the soundtrack for like a month or two. What was the Santa song that the girl in the blue dress sang? Like oh. the one that was actually part of the talent show? Yeah. No, she, uh, one of the girls, it's a Christmas movie too. It, yeah, it yeah. Yeah. It is a Christmas movie. It's a, it's a high school musical zombie Christmas movie. And, um, she sings a song where it's basically her being super sexual towards Santa. Being <laughs> like, come down my chimney and unload your sack. You know? <laughs> oh, shit. And the school administrators are like, can she sing? <laughs> And they had like shirtless high schoolers with candy canes dancing in the background. <laughs> oh no, it's it's great, and that and that's the thing is that like it is it is a high school musical, but a lot of the musical numbers, especially if you watch the background dancers, because they're not not all of them are great. Like some of them were fucking up pretty bad, which is great. But um, it really comes off like like it was their them trying to do high school musical. Like these actual high school kids are trying to do their own thing, even though it's in their minds and all that. Hmm. And it kind of gives like a more heart to it especially since like in the beginning they're being super extra about like little th- like typical things like oh my dad doesn't believe in what i want to do and i can't get wait to get away with him oh i have a crush on my best friend and then once the zombie apocalypse happens none of that matters and huh. they go from uh being stuck in their being snarky minds to um like one of the characters they they cracked a joke right before they died and then <laughs> and that and they were joking with them so it made the main character have to step up and like really realize what the situation she's in and it was just surprisingly really good character development in this cheesy fun again high school musical that just happened to have zombies and there's only <laughs> one song where they say where they sing about yeah. zombies the zombies almost do feel like an afterthought it is more about um it's more about the high school kids and how they I mean it could have been it didn't necessarily have to be zombies it could have been like a nuclear holocaust or you know it it could have been some other threat but there's more to love with the more if you watch i highly recommend seeing it a second time just because like during the whole uh the when the what school bully sings the the one's a song about zombies or he's singing when it comes to killing zombies on the top of my class yeah you've been hiding i've been kicking some ass it's him and his goons and they're like doing slow motion poses while they're taking out these zombies but they're like it's like this 80s montage song uh but they're like purposely posing to seem more badass than they are and like it happens like good job you took out a bunch of geriatric zombies (laughs) cool but it's worth the 9.99 especially since there's no details about it being getting a home release anytime soon so i'd recommend it what else has gone on this week um well, I saw a couple of uh, screens last week. Uh, let's see. Uh, last weekend uh, was the third anniversary of American Cinematheque's Cinematic Void, so they did a hell of a triple feature. Uh, Phantasm, 3 o'clock high, and uh, well, at 10 to midnight. And uh, we actually had Don Coscarelli at the theater for Phantasm, along with uh, his producer, Peter Pepperman. And it was really interesting, uh, you know, the... Well, it's always interesting to hear about the behind the scenes about Phantasm just because it's a real labor love amateur movie, but still holds up so well. And uh, we screened the 4K transfer from Bad Robot. And it is so astounding how great of a transfer that is, because, like, it just looks and sounds so good, you'd swear it was made, like, just a few years ago. Was anybody from 3 o'clock high there? Uh, sadly, no. We only had guests for Phantasm, but... 
uh, that was just cool to screen because I can't even think of a time that's screened in the area. And yeah, so basically they wanted to do uh, like a horror movie, a, a comedy movie, and a cult movie, which are kind of the three tenets of Sim Mac Void. And uh, also we did 10 o'clock, uh, sorry, we did 10 to midnight. Uh, because that actually had some scenes shot at the Arrow Theater in Santa Monica of, like, the uh, killer needs an alibi while he goes to kill people, so he does this thing where he goes to a screening of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and, like, is talking it up with some with some girls, and then during the movie he, he escapes through the bathroom and then runs out naked to kill his victims. It was the other thing, too. He kills his victims while he's uh, stripped naked, and... Uh, and of course, it's up to Charles Bronson to take him down, even yeah. after even if he has to go against the law. But anyway, uh, the other screening I went to earlier this week, um, Tuesday at Tarantino Theater, the new Bev was the end of their Burt Reynolds series in honor of the great late Burt Reynolds. So I decided to end uh, on Grindhouse Tuesday with uh, a couple of his lesser known, but. Uh, over-the-top action movies from the 1980s, uh, Malone and Heat, and both are really great in their own ways. Like, uh, Malone basically has Burt Reynolds as a CIA hitman who decides to retire because he's sick of the business, and he's, like, traveling through the Midwest, and he ends up in Wyoming, and his car breaks down, and he ends up in this town where this evil industrialist survivalist guy is uh, taking over and, like, forcing people off their land. So it kind of turns into a uh, modern-day, or, you know, 80s set western where Burt Reynolds has to uh, fight these bad guys uh, who are trying to steal their land and he is like a neo-noir where he plays a bodyguard muscle for hire who wants to uh, make enough money to move to Venice Italy and he gets wrapped up in this plot with this sadistic son of a gangster who's been like beating and torturing women and like he beats up a girl uh, who's friends with Burt Reynolds so he helps her get back at him and it gets out of hand and and I love them both because it's uh, that kind of trend where like yeah you know like with Charles Bronson where uh, you know they did so many action movies in like the seventies and sixties that they upped the ante in the eighties so like there's a couple of great deaths in, in both movies like uh, in Malone. Burt Reynolds tricks a goon into co- going into a gazebo and he blows him up with a grenade that he left there for him. And in Heat, there's at one point he kills uh, a gangster. Uh, keep in mind that Burt's character in Heat refuses to use guns, so he st- he like impales this dude on a crowbar into an electrical outlet so that he gets impaled and electrocuted. Double dead. <laughs> yeah, double dead. All right, before we move on to the subgenre. Uh- there's something exciting that you guys are going to be doing in April, I think. You oh, want to tell everybody? Yes. Yeah, we're going to Fire <laughs> Festival Part 2. Electric Boogaloo. A.K.A. Eric Andre's uh, birthday party. Yeah. So, so. for context, uh, Eric Andre is, of course, the host of the Eric Andre Show. And this year for his birthday, decided to do a big uh, show uh, block party or, or celebration at the region in Los Angeles. And he's framing it as a sequel to Firefest, like the flyer ha- advertised uh, FEMA tents, cardboard and cheese sandwiches. Oh, so some of the special guests were like that dude who, sm- who sucks dick. <laughs> uh, they did. Is a, he um, really going to be there, though? Or I, did they just I say? I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised. I really <laughs> wouldn't. Um, but I would because he's he's always unpredictable, and um, he's embracing his that meme too. He, I, I can see yeah. him having a sense of humor about it and showing up. Yeah, I would get paid just to show up and be like, yeah. <laughs> I was asked to suck dick and I was prepared to do it, and then <laughs> just going, all right, bye guys. I hope Joe Rule shows up. All I know is. I'm I'm just prepared for anything. Like gonna make sure I take some aspirin before I head down. <laughs> you know, so my arthritis doesn't bother me and I'm just gonna just let what happens happens, you know? You guys need to uh Facebook live it. Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna be a real found footage Blair Witch <laughs> thing. Like Eric Andre's gonna probably seal us up. We're gonna have to survive in FEMA tents. By the way, I, I feel like I just aged myself really bad or it's like, Hey, we're going to this thing, what are you doing to pregame? Oh, I'm gonna take some aspirin. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, it's like fuck. We're getting old. But, All right, let's uh, let's move on to our subgenre of the episode. What do we got, Jacob? Okay, well, uh, Jordan Peele's Us is coming up soon, so I thought it'd be cool to talk about uh, a surprising recurring subject in horror: uh, evil doppelgangers and alter egos. You know, like it just because uh, Jordan Peele was saying, you know, like with his movie, he considers uh, sometimes we're our own worst enemies, and. That, that's uh, that that does ring true quite a bit. Uh, so, like right off the bat, wanted to talk about one of my personal favorites, Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, the Robert Louis Stevenson classic, which has gotten so many adaptations and parodies over the years. Although uh, I have to say, a uh, personal favorite adaptation would have to be the 1930s version um, with uh, uh, Frederick March and. Yeah, that, and that was pretty interesting because, you know, it's like the one where, you know, he's a Victorian gentleman, doctor, professor, and he's about to get married and he comes up with this potion that basically uh, lets his id run wild. And But when he takes it, like, he turns into kind of like a, an ape man, animal man, who is just such an asshole. Like, he, like he is so evil, like, he... Uh, like does everything as petty as tripping a waiter at a restaurant to like beating a dude to death with his cane one of the the biggest um bummers of universal pulling the plug on the dark universe is that we're not going to get their dr jekyll and mr hyde which was uh from the mummy uh dr jekyll was in it uh, it was russell crowe mm. and he to me was the high point of the movie um and we're not going to get to see his uh a whole movie. I, I would love to see that whole movie. I mean, we already saw that back when Russell Crowe was on the sauce and <laughs> would just get drunk and fight his directors and fans, you know. South Park made a song about it, so. Fighting round the world. Fighting round the world. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and that would have been sad, but I mean, isn't that like the biggest uh, fears is seeing that side, like that other side of us come out, like when we have those moments of anger and like being consumed by it it's why it's such a big popular running theme not only in horror films but you see it go into comic books with the hulk and stuff mm. um even just seeing that something else with our face not to bash on twins we're not saying that at all but like the horror aspect of the unknown or seeing us give into something that we have no control over kind of like george in the 2018 film rampage you know <laughs> really becoming something else and something <laughs> more dangerous like that other aspect of us Nice slip in of Rampage. <laughs> Rampage is, of course, available out on DVD, Blu-ray, Ultra 4K. Uh, give us money, Warner Brothers. <laughs> Have either of you guys seen Enemy? Uh, the, no. the, yes. the Denny Villeneuve? Yes. I projected it years ago. It has my, uh, my uh, not James McAvoy, but my other man crush, Jake Gyllenhaal, pulling double duty because he, he plays a, uh, I think it's a history teacher, um, but it might be English or math. I don't know. He's some kind of a teacher. And he is watching a movie one night and he sees basically a guy who looks like him. So he looks up all his other movies and keeps finding this guy who looks like him. And then he looks the guy up and he lives in the same town. And, you know, of course, nefarious things Ha, you know, he he plays both the actor and the teacher, and they're you know it's it's they're they're not separated at birth twins. There's other things going on, mm. but uh, it it enemy is it's 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 a crazy movie, and it's got the most batshit ending ever. And I'm talking Ooh. like last like three or four seconds of the <laughs> damn you know like like the credits start coming on. You're like, what the hell did I just watch? It's one of those movies. No, yeah, it's, it's really great. And, um, it was actually funny because when I projected enemy years ago, there was one screening that, cause it wasn't just a movie theater. It was a live theater too. So we'd have to wheel out the, uh, the, the speakers behind the screen after each live show. And they forgot to turn it on one time. And I didn't double check that day for whatever reason. So half the audio was gone. And afterwards, and this is, this is how like creepy and nightmarish enemy is because half the audio was gone and there were people pretending like that's what it was supposed to be. I'm standing there <laughs> trying to hand out vouchers being like, I'm sorry, I fucked up here. Have another ticket all to all six people who came to the screening <laughs> that day. And I had people fighting me being like, oh, you don't need to. That was a, uh, that was on purpose. I'm like, N no, it wasn't. I can tell you right now it wasn't. I literally hit the switch after and the sound yeah. came back they're like no no i'm they, the projectionist who fucked it up i know yeah. it was wrong <laughs> like thank you for trying to make me feel better but you're not you're making me very frustrated at this moment please stop <laughs> and take this fucking voucher <laughs> uh i guess in terms of other um 
uh, doppelganger movies. One of my personal favorites is uh, Stephen King and George Romero's The Dark Half. Yeah. Yeah. Which uh, I feel, which is very interesting because it has a very meta origin. Because uh, remember, King used to write uh, additional books under a pseudonym, Richard Bachman, and then it got found out, so he decided to kill uh, his pen name. And so I guess he had the idea, like, oh, what if, it, what if that pen name came to life? And so the story is uh, also about an author who decides to uh, kill off his pen name, but then he starts getting like these threatening calls from somebody claimed to be. Um, his uh, his pen name and people close to him start to die, so it 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 is pretty um, creepy, especially because it starts off pretty grounded, but then it gets uh, really weird. Like, and also this is King and uh, Ramiro going off of Creep Show, so it still has that vibe. And that's very King, isn't it? King's always like. What if this was alive and evil? What if this <laughs> car was alive and evil? What if my pen name was alive and evil? <laughs> what if cell phones were alive and evil? You know? Yeah. And it's, it actually features a pair of great performances from Timothy Hutton. Um, yep. And, and you're right with the creep show thing. I mean, you're spot on because especially when in the scenes with the, uh, quote, fake personality – it's almost like a comic book come to life, which is a lot of like what creep show, yeah. you know, I mean, there, there's like, you know, red on one side, blue on the other, you know, like there's, you know, heavy lit coming through a window kind of a thing. It's, 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 it's makes you wonder, you're like, how much of this is in his head and how much of it is really happening kind of a thing. But it wasn't as brutal as the book. The book, first of all, Dark Half was my first King book. I bought it for 50 cents at a library when I was a kid. And so when I found a copy of Dark Half on VHS as a kid, I was very disappointed it wasn't as graphic. You know, like, he, they didn't have him slice off the sheriff's balls, like, okay. or something, you know? But, I, yeah, the book was very brutal. It, that's, yeah, it, it's the book that got me to stop reading Animorphs, because I was like, all right, well, fuck this shit. This is way cooler. <laughs> this dude just got his ball sliced off with a shaver. Okay. Yeah, how do you go back to young adult? Yeah. You can't. <laughs> Sorry, Harry Potter. Yeah. I was going to say, though, that in the movie, that's also uh, Michael Rooker uh, play, plays the sheriff, who's a recurring character. Uh, well, it's a different sheriff, though. I, I, don't think he, I don't think that happened to him in the books because he comes back later. Uh, but yeah, so the yeah the sheriff, he, he pops up in um, Castle Rock, the TV show. It's Lance Henriksen's character and uh, Needful Things. He's, he's there, too. So it's pretty interesting to have that kind of connection. Um but yeah, I feel like the movie's pretty brutal too, because uh, like the pe uh, the author or the uh, uh, the pen name of the author guy come to life, uh, like kills people really brutally. Like he stabs a dude and then sets him on fire, and like he slices a dude's throat open because he's got like this trademark switchblade, and he, and it's also reflective on uh, the good guy author. Like he kills people that uh, annoy him, so it's that interesting connection, and it is c cool, like. I don't think it's too much of a spoiler, but there is a supernatural element to it that's revealed toward the end and, like, with the birds. Like, that... Like, I thought that stuff was really cool. But, yeah, I feel like it's pretty underrated. Um, I, I definitely want to give it a rewatch. Like, I think it's available for streaming on uh, Shout TV or Amazon Prime. Plus, uh, yeah, Scream Factory did a Blu-ray for it a while ago. Yeah. They also, uh, speaking of Scream Factory, uh, there's another t one of these twins movies, Dead Ringers, yeah. which is um, it's one of the transitional Cronenberg movies between. Um, I mean, we talked about Existence, you know, last last time. Uh, this one was, you know, like post Fly, but pre Oscar bait, pre a history right. of violence kind of thing, and and it is uh, it stars Jeremy Irons as twin gynecologists, based on a true story. And, it's based on real guys, yeah, and who would do a lot of the weird, terrible things that these guys, that Jeremy Irons characters, uh, you know, with an S would do because uh, the things you can d get away with when you're a twin, I guess. Yeah, like they'd swap girlfriends and. Yeah. Yeah. But Jeremy Irons' performance is brilliant because they do those things. They're two totally different personalities. So one would be more suave with the ladies, the other one's super shy. But then, like, through, as the movie progresses, their personalities kind of not only switch because they're starting to forget who is who, but they're kind of melting together and they kind of become different people throughout it. And at one point they introduce the most like terrifying pieces of guy and 
gynecologist, a gynecology <laughs> equipment ever. Like mm-hmm. that made me terrified to have a vagina. Oh, uh, just oh. looking at them, like yeah. I was like, oh. And like my girlfriend said, next week's being like, yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> that was dead ringers, but then you have dead ringer which is uh, Betty Davis mm, playing yeah. twins back in the day. One is a, is a rich woman and the other is her, t- her twin who kills her and takes the place of the, of the rich woman. <laughs> right. And, you know, you can probably guess how that goes. And very well. Mm. I'm assuming everyone was very happy in the end <laughs> yeah. because one person made a decent sacrifice. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> decent sacrifice. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> took one for the team. Yeah, you know it's, it's, it was a romantic comedy. <laughs> she was poor. Her sister was rich. After murdering her, the family came together. <laughs> You're making it sound like a Schwarzenegger DeVito movie. Oh yeah. God, <laughs> Betty Davis is a dead ringer. Yeah, so uh, that would be another interesting version of twins. All right, let's uh, let's move on to our topic, which uh, I think Korea can probably explain it much more passionately than I could because he's been getting pissed. Let's hear it, Korea. What are we going to talk about? Oh, oh, we're, oh! This, <laughs> is this is this becoming a segment? Korea's pissed about something. <laughs> no, this this is our topic. This <laughs> this is your Andy Rooney segment. This is where I, you know what really grinds my wheels? <laughs> I was going to say grinds my gears. Or grinds my gears. <laughs> He's going to say it. He's going to say it. <laughs> you know what's been pissing me off? What? No. Uh, social media. No. Um, <laughs> but it is. Social media, uh, media in general, hoaxes is what we're focusing on this week because of the fucking Momo challenge. <laughs> now, <laughs> for those who don't know what the Momo challenge is, what it is is – Again, this has been debunked for rather largely, but what it's supposed to be is there's this creature called Momo. It's a creepy photo. It's a close-up of this Jap- Japanese sculpture called uh, Mother Bird, and um, but they close up on it, so it's even creepier than what it looks like. And you're supposed to find like this number to contact Momo on um whatsapp that should let you know immediately how fucking stupid (laughs) this is that you have to pull up whatsapp to engage it but uh what momo does is it's once you contact momo it's gonna give you a series of challenges that you have to do or you're cursed it's your classic bloody mary but the challenges range from like drink a glass of water really quick to self-harm yourself and send photographic evidence. And then the final challenge is you're supposed to kill yourself for Momo. And it's fucking stupid because it is pure media hype. It is, um, that's perpetuated by YouTube influence and influencer culture because there's all these videos of popular, uh, YouTube personalities doing the challenge and it's fake. They're not actually doing it. And if they actually do do it, most none rarely actually contact this Momo creature because it doesn't exist. <laughs> and what the media is doing is – and by media, I mean your moms, your aunts, fucking CNN. Everybody is sharing this picture of this Momo, this, te- this yeah. really creepy photo on how it's like cropped out the rest of it and all this stuff. And they're sharing around telling everyone that this thing is trying to get your kids to kill themselves. And it's bullshit. And it's such bullshit. It's like if there was a few instances, there's no attributed deaths to it. Um, These images keep popping up in terrifying children because that's the big hook is that it's terrifying kids. And it keeps popping up in terrifying kids because you keep fucking sharing it. You idiots with these (laughs) fucking articles are sharing this and perpetuating it. It's a creature that's being created because we're sharing it. We're probably going to get a horror film out of it later down the road like Slender Man or some other shit. Well, you just know people were already writing the scripts as soon as it as it made the headlines. There's already sexual fan art of Momo. Like, there kind of is a movie about this. Have you guys seen Nerve? Uh, from a few years back? Yeah, 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 yeah I remember the, that. Where there's like an app where um, people will pledge money if you take these dares, and yeah. the dares get increasingly more intense, harder, and you know, and the last dare is you know going to supposedly death defying. So it kind of it there kind of already is a movie, but I mean th- that Momo character 
that's going to sell a Momo movie. So yeah, <laughs> there, there, there's one coming up. But also Cursed Video, The Ring. Yeah. You know? It's similar to something called the Blue Whale Challenge that was, I think it was mainly in Russia and Asia. And they actually did, um, it was basically the same thing where there's a list of challenges you have to do. And, you know, they range from self-harm to eventually killing yourself and supposedly they did find a couple of russian teenagers who did kill themselves and a guy did get arrested and he was charged with uh god i I forget the exact charge but it was something like conspiracy to commit harm or something like so there is a basis of fact in the blue whale challenge and that may be the influence of the momo challenge but the main thing that people are complaining about is that these there's videos of Momo doing it, and it's just the image, and it's there going, Momo wants to drink water. You know, some weird voice, and that was I, – I you guys might not know this, but that was a pretty good impression. Uh, not too <laughs> I haven't seen any of the videos. But, I've just seen the picture. Either way, a good but, Smeagol. Right. It, oh, yeah, I do a great Smeagol. But <laughs> what, what they're complaining about is that these are popping up in the middle of, of videos. Yeah. Uh, in the middle of, of kids', kids videos. videos. Yeah. So it's popping up on YouTube Kids. And what this whole Momo chat – what the thing that really pisses me off about the whole Momo challenge, is, uh, like conspiracy, is that it's actually – kind of taking away from actual issues with kid-oriented YouTube videos. There are videos that star popular characters like Peppa the Pig that are not official Peppa the Pig videos that um, are attributed to grooming children for pedophilia and stuff like that there was a guy who found um there, there's a big uh if, if i can find the video i'll i'll uh i'll link it to our facebook page there was a guy who found basically you can watch a kid's video and it, within like two clicks he was he was to a part of youtube where there's all of this sex trafficking yeah yeah i remember hearing about that not only is that stuff exist, but the videos are monetized. So people are getting paid for it. So he, and, and I mean, he was That's pissed as up. he was talking. I'll, I'll see if I can find the video and I'll, and I'll post it if, in case anybody is curious about it. Yeah. I remember that it was like a news report on NBC or something. Yeah. And that's the, and that's the problem with something like this. First of all, this wild spread of, Kids are doing this. We see it all the time. Millennials are eating Tide Pods (laughs) or kids are having rainbow parties. Just yesterday at, uh, you know, that conservative uh, conference CPAC, like they were railing against uh, teenagers are doing Skittle games where they put a bunch of pills into a bowl and they start taking the different pills. And nobody has any proof that has ever happened. No, it's the same with rainbow parties and it's same with the satanic panic of the 80s where they would release videos being like, here's the evidence. Is your kid into Satan? (laughs) Go into their room, rummage through their shit. Did you find an upside down cross? Did you find a Necronomicon? Did you find a ritual dagger? Then he's probably into Satanism. Well, first of all, (laughs) if you're finding that shit in your kid's room, they're definitely doing that shit or at least trying to be cool. (laughs) But I found this upside down cross. But if I hold it this way. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Right. I actually found that uh, video the other day, like, everything is terrible, I think shares it now and again, but, yeah, like, they, they made an actual police uh, procedural video and, yeah. and for for both cops and uh, uh, parents of, uh, like, how can you tell that your kid is a Satanist? And it's, it's absurd, like, they think yeah. their kids are going out and, like, sacrificing goats. And again, what, I know a lot of people are thinking, what's the harm in sharing this? What's the harm in blowing up about this stuff? And it's, again, it's taking away from actual fucking issues. Yeah. People were so concerned about the satanic panic that it got to the point where suddenly every murder, all right, we got to look for satanic shit and this crime scene. It's like, no, you need to be looking for real fucking evidence. And don't forget, like, that's also what led to uh, the West Memphis Three being arrested. You know, those uh, poor kids who were basically railroaded by the cops because they were into heavy metal and they... Uh, were essentially framed for uh, for a crime they didn't commit. Well, also, all the attention is what is going to create the threat. Like, you see, yeah. like, like Slender Man was basically invented by... It was some Reddit. message board. Yeah, it was, just, yeah. Uh, it was just some stories online. Yeah, and, and people, it, it, people took it and ran with it. They would Photoshop him into pictures, and then people who weren't part of that message board were thinking this was real shit. And next thing you know, you've got, you know, 
I talked about the movie Terror in the Woods, you know, a few episodes ago. You've got two little girls stabbing a third in the middle of the woods in the name of Slender Man. You know, you're creating the problem, you know, and, and it's not the movies that are creating the problem. It is the media hyping it up. Yeah. You know, I mean, how long until someone says, oh, yeah, I'm going to kill myself in the name of the Momo challenge. I mean, hopefully that doesn't happen because hopefully right. everybody is smart enough to know early enough that. It's bullshit. And that's one of the things that I'm actually happy that because as much as this is a creation of the internet and the much as it has spread like wildfire in a couple of days, like I literally saw it go from like just a couple of crazy people from back home talking about it to like it being fucking national news like, during my breaks at work. Yeah. And um, it's insane how much this inf- how much this misinformation has been spread. But also we're living in a time where information had spreads fast too uh maybe not as fast fast. because it's not as catchy but very quickly people were disproving it very quickly people were calling it out as a hoax but again we're creating our own modern monsters doing this and it's again taking away people are saying oh disney's pulling uh like advertising from youtube because of this no they're not they're pulling it because of the issues of these videos that are grooming children that are uh, making things okay, and you and it's not hard going on to YouTube and seeing situation, see like finding videos where somebody made it where it's like a Spider Man or a Pixar character, and it like in the middle of the video, all of a sudden they're doing stuff that's uh, grooming techniques um, for making things that adults want to do to children okay, and that is a major issue because we have stuff like. YouTube is such a huge thing with kids. I have people talking about how their kid, their five-year-old made their own YouTube channel, which is insane to me. Yeah. Uh, mostly because I'm still illiterate as fuck when it comes to the internet. But um, – and that's the thing is that they have such crazy access and people think it's OK. Oh, all right. They're just watching videos on the YouTube Kids app. But these aren't getting flagged enough. YouTube needs to do more about their algorithms and catching these things. And the only way we can do that is by focusing on actual issues. This Momo challenge is just, again, it's influencers and YouTube personalities and news outlets just hype, jumping on a hype train to get more views. And it's it's very um, – it's not good. Like I, I don't know how to sum it up any better. Like, like you were saying, yeah, it's it's just a recurrent of something that's happened in the past. It's an it's a modern day urban legend that's taken away from actual uh, societal issues. You know, like um, that's like that story about uh, I think it was from the '60s. Like a a girl smokes marijuana while babysitting and uh, roasts the baby, thinking it's a turkey. You know, it's a, it's an absurd like story just made to uh, stir up stir up. Um, fear in the public and well and it's a problem that doesn't exist that gets people upset over an absurd fake problem when we got some real issues we need to focus on instead of the dangers of smoking marijuana it's the dangers of unsupervised internet use you know which is what it boils down to that's what people are saying well monitor your children's internet use and they'll they won't fall into the momo trap it's like well well a little bit i mean like if you have a five-year-old watching youtube on your cell phone yeah double check make sure like check in on them check in with what they're watching um i believe in privacy i don't think you should do that all the time especially once your kid hits uh teenage years you probably don't want to be looking at their history too too deeply (laughs) uh thinking back to my own teenage years and the discovery of certain sites um but um but there is but there is a level of where you do need to be a parent you do and this is again coming from three dudes who don't have kids (laughs) um you, like have uh, take a little bit more of a step in responsibility on what your kids are consuming. We do it with television. We monitor what's on what they watch when they're sitting in front of the telly, right? Why can't you do that with their online use? And it is a and it is an issue that we need to that YouTube especially needs to address. And they're already getting slammed for it. But focusing on this Momo challenge, it's kind of like if we were saying like, "Hey guys, have you heard of this VHS tape that's cursed?" If you watch it, you die within four days. You know, it's the same type of story. So let's – I want this to be the last time we uh, – first and last time we ever bring up the fucking Momo challenge so that we can get back to, you know, performing our satanic rituals at our rainbow parties. <laughs> <laughs> let's lighten things up a little and bring it back to movies. Do you guys remember the Charlie Charlie challenge? Uh, Yeah, I remember that. Four yeah. years ago? That was one – first of all, I have two – 
it, well, one issue with the Charlie Charlie Challenge, one thing that pissed me off about it and one thing I thought was genius. First of all, whenever you try to watch those damn Charlie Charlie videos, they would always like they would show something and then it'd be like super close up. It's something to do with pencils and yeah. gravity making it roll. But the the camera would be really close on it and then all of a sudden it would like stop real quick and go nope 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 i'm not doing this nope 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 it's like before anything happened it's like you can't see what's supposed to happen but the second thing that was kind of impressive is it was revealed that that whole charlie charlie challenge was all just this viral marketing campaign for that movie the gallows Remember oh the gallows? yeah yeah which uh, is actually a pretty bad movie yeah, yeah. but but the charlie charlie challenge which which did go viral and people kept doing it but the videos they would—I I still to this day don't know what was supposed to happen. Anytime something would start to happen, they go, "Nope, nope, uh, uh-uh, nope, nope, I'm out. Nope, 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 I'm out." I, I, well, what? What? It was like a cheaper uh, one of those like um, freaking uh, Ouija board. Ouija board. It was kind of like a Ouija was? board thing. Like you bounce the pen and then you ask Charlie Charlie a question and it'll fall in a space. At least that's what I understand. Again, but as soon as it would move, the people would like, "Nope, uh, uh-uh, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done." It's like, well, no. Don't but, be done. What's it supposed to do? <laughs> and that's what they're doing with the Mobo challenge too because like you message this thing and a lot of people just fake it and they message their friend and it's like, are you there? Are you there? Momo wants you to do this. And then they start going, nope, 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 can't do it. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, <laughs> you now have a video where, you know, Turbo Kid 47.9 is <sighs> doing the Momo challenge and people are going to watch it because it's hip, it's trending. Yeah. But it's like the influencers that tagged themselves in Los Angeles during the fires because people were trying to see who's safe and then suddenly your vacation videos from fucking four years ago are popping up, you know? Yeah. And what, uh, anybody who knows where you live, if you're marked as safe, they know that you're not at your house. You know? yeah. <laughs> and and then they could, you know, I mean, there's looting going on in the evacuation zones all the time, so I don't know. Yeah, and, um, you know, taking a step back... Um... Uh, like I said, you know, it's um, th- these sort of stories and th- these sort of trends are just intrinsic to our society. You know, just uh, there have been urban legends similar, if not like these, for decades. Um, and oh, razor blades in the candy. Yeah, yeah. Trick or treat. And yeah, no, yeah. That's no. why you know I'm thinking back to uh, the the 1998 urban legend movie because uh, you know that one was like a killer who uses urban legends as their. Uh, uh, weapon of uh, M- uh, M.O. And they even say in movie that like all, uh, those urban legends are unsubstantiated so it's basically just the killer theming their kills uh, on these urban legends and tying it into uh, also around that time Scream. You know, it's like uh, movies or in this case stories don't create psychos. They make psychos more creative. Right. Yeah. And- so you're saying that Mikey didn't die by drinking a Coke and eating Pop Rocks? No. I, he did not. No, he didn't. And again, I'm going to have to re- rewrite my Twitter bio. <laughs> yeah. And, but it's ridiculous. And we've all been – like when I was in uh, middle school, they had us do a uh, presentation for the kids in the sixth grade because there were rumors that they were doing – R- rainbow parties. I'm going to keep oh, bringing pff. up rainbow parties because it's how <laughs> fucking ridiculous. You don't know what a rainbow party is. You know, generally, it's a party of <laughs> middle schoolers and girls wear different lipsticks and they see how, you know, they leave marks on uh, penises and to see who can go down further. That was a huge thing. Oprah covered it. Rainbow parties. It's sweeping <laughs> the nation. It doesn't get any more real than Oprah. These kids are <laughs> getting STDs from... These 12-year-olds are getting STDs from rainbow parties. Never has there ever been a documented case of this happening. And I remember even then when they asked us to do a skit, they're like, John, you're eccentric. You should be in this skit thing. <laughs> like how fucking ridiculous it was sounding. And I even asked the kids, I'm like, is any of this happening? And they're like, we don't even know how to do half that stuff. We're fucking 12 years old. Like, oh, God. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's absurd, you know? It's just like it's uh, word of mouth. And, uh, yeah, and I also go back to... Um, that Joel Schumacher movie, Eight Millimeter. Remember that? Because yeah. oh, because yeah. uh, that's another thing, you know. Snuff films like that was they don't exist. They don't like the yeah. especially There's back then when it was cases. Not of a person who has actually been killed for the sake of making the movie. There's plenty of people who have been killed on film, but yeah. it's always been another reason. That case in Italy where the guy was selling the videos. Um, I'm, I'm I don't really that. remember that, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, the point being, though, is that especially around that time, this is like 1999, so, you know, we're talking like uh, yeah. internet is just starting and like and most stuff is, you know, just like VHS and, and film and that 
titular eight millimeter. Like again, you know, in story, they say there's never been a substantiated uh, case of a snuff film. You know, like somebody paying to have somebody killed on camera for entertainment purposes. Um, but you know, it's like it uh, and. Uh, spoilers for a movie that's uh 20 years old uh it turns out uh like a du- like in the movie a dude paid to make a snuff film because uh nobody would uh, has actually made a snuff film at that point it's like some rich uh dude's uh perverted desire or something like he uh, and in real life yeah there's especially around that time there was never really a ca- there was never a case outright of somebody paying dudes to find somebody and kill them on camera for their entertainment and uh but still even then there was all those rumors about you know like uh like i remember hearing an urban legend about people leaving snuff films in the cases at blockbuster and people coming home with a tape like they think of renting a movie but they're accidentally renting a snuff film and watching somebody get killed but that never actually happened and that's what the momo challenge is yeah same story different trends i knew a guy in the early 90s who owned a video store and he said people would actually call up and ask if he had snuff films and he's like first of all if i did you wouldn't be able to just call me up and say hey buddy i don't know you but do you have snuff films (laughs) not only that but it wouldn't be the regular 449 for three-day rental all right in the Italy case, it was uh, they. He was selling a VHS tapes of them for ten grand a pop. Oh yeah. So I mean, it's. I'm gonna have to look into that. I've I'd never heard. Yeah, I never heard yeah, about that either. Th- there's a documentary called Snuff that's well worth uh, checking out where they discuss that and um, they show like what the difference is between between a what an actual snuff film is and what a lot of people will miscategorize as it whether it's and they show like a couple of scenes from like. Uh, uh, faces of death right and uh, the killing ends, of america yeah and it ends with uh an interview with one of the producers of the original texas chainsaw massacre and he describes the instance when or the the time where he was where he did view one where like they they would and it's very sketchy and he did not want to be there and he was crying the entire time like talking about it because it affected him so much jesus yeah well supposedly there was some there was some movie that mike Patton, i think from faith no more watched where um i think it was mike Patton, um or maybe it was charlie sheen i remember oh, there was oh some wait movie. no it was charlie sheen he was i i know this story he was with some friends and they were watching this japanese movie uh called human guinea pig Yes, and it, yes, and it yes, showed it somebody yeah. being killed, and it looked so much like a snuff film. He called the uh, he called the Interpol, FBI. the FBI, and the filmmakers yeah. got arrested. So it was uh, a similar case to uh, uh, Cannibal, uh, Holocaust. Cannibal Holocaust, where the filmmakers yeah. were put on trial, and they had to prove that the actors were still alive and like showed the special effects techniques. So you know, yeah. it, was, it was a case. Wow. It was you know, th- this is actually. I mean, this has happened a few times, I guess, and you know, going with Face of Death that. Uh, you know they make something that is like a snuff film but it's yeah you know they they disprove it in court that it was just a very convincing uh uh film and you know as we've discussed these trends are universal throughout history and you know with the internet it's it, it, well it's all about communication you know we've got the internet now so communication is faster than ever and these stories travel faster than ever fear also travels fast you know you got your uh monsters are due on maple street so sadly you know the even you know fortunately the momo challenge has been debunked but it is distracting as jonathan said from real issues uh affect affecting kids especially in, in the internet age and you know it's only a matter of time before something similar takes its place because you know mass communication equals mass panic right and that's the thing is that we just need to be more adamant about not giving in to the sensational stories. And that's the thing is, again, this is a at the at the core of it, it's a picture of a sculpture that is not meant to be scary. It's it's a it's a mother bird. That's the name of the sculpture. That's all it is, is a human bird hybrid, and we have created this monster out of it. And it's it is damaging, but we can use this also as a as an opportunity for discussion. We can have talks with our kids about what we about what we consume online, about what we watch, about what we should be looking out for, and telling our kids to tell us when they do come across something that doesn't seem right. Is like if your kid comes up to you and goes, "I was watching this Peppa the Pig video, and it was." Um, 
t- telling me uh, and it was showing images of Peppa being tied up or something like that. This is stuff that we need to be discussing with our kids to be on the lookout for so we can help take down those type of videos. What we can't give into is the fake uh, stuff like Momo because it can lead to much more dangerous things. It could lead to the hype, uh, give into the hype and lead to people getting hurt. Yeah. So. Well said. Yeah. All right. Well, we've vented long enough about this. Let's get yeah. the hell out of here. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> our uh, music is Restless Spirit. So track them down and rock with them. And our artwork is Chris Fisher. So hire him to draw something for you. And uh, where can we find you guys on Twitter? Jacob. You can find me at Jacob Davison underscore. That is at J-A-C-O-B-D-A-V-I-S-O-N underscore. And Korea. And you can find me at Korean Barbecue on Twitter and Instagram. It's C-O-R-R-E-I-A-N-B-B-Q. And uh, don't forget to check us out on uh, on our Facebook, Ion Horror, uh, I, and also the website that we write for, iHorror, iHorror News on Twitter. And... Uh, what was that app name again? I haven't been on it in a while. Stardust. Stardust. <laughs> Don't forget to check us out on Stardust. I haven't posted in a while, but we will, uh, of course, Kelly posts regularly, and I'll be coming back to that soon now that I have more time on my hands uh, coming up. And I, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Cinema Firite, which that's like Verite, but Fear, that's F-E-A-R-I-T-E. And you can find all three of us at the iHorror Facebook and the I on Horror Facebook, as Korea said. So if you, what are your thoughts on this whole Momo thing? Are we overreacting or are we just getting pissed off about nothing? Well, I know we're getting pissed off about nothing, but um, yeah, let us know what you think. Um, and don't post us videos of you going through the challenges because, you know, that's just ridiculous. Yeah, we don't uh, care. If anything, <laughs> just go watch Rampage again. Tell us what you think about <laughs> Rampage. Yes. Um, if anything, don't send us you doing the Momo challenge. Send us your reactions to Rampage. If you – if anyone sends us a reaction to Rampage, I will give you a digital copy. Uh, or if you tell us on the Facebook page that you're going to watch Rampage, well, I'll send you a copy so that you can watch it. How's that Can sound, I do that? I, I, I'm telling you right now I will watch Rampage. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I'm not giving you guys copies. Nah. This is for our viewers. I already know you've listened to the show. Like, come on. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, let's get the hell out of here. For me, James J. Edwards. I'm Jacob Davison. And I'm Jonathan Korea. Keep your eye on horror.